Welcome to City on the Hill, everyone. Even though we're physically apart, it's always good to worship with the people of God. Well, I want to begin our time by reading two passages, um, and which will be on the screen. Psalm 72, 18 says, Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, as we begin, I invite you to take a moment to think about the attributes of God. The Bible tells us that he is eternal, unchanging, all-present, all-wise, all-powerful, merciful, glorious, and I can go on and on and on. But reflecting on the attributes of God is important because they become the foundation and reasons for all that we do as Christians. We worship because he is holy. We can be fearless because we know that he is sovereign and good. We can be comforted knowing that he is faithful. He will never leave or forsake us. We can be freed from guilt of sin and have hope for the future because of his grace and love that, was, that were displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. Knowing all these things, how can we keep from singing his praises? And I invite you to sing this song with me and let's bless his beautiful name. Blessed. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place Though I walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in, Lord Still I will sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose. Lord, 
Blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. I will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And amen. At this time, why don't we read our new city catechism together? This is a question 17. I'll, I'll read the question and let's answer this together. Church, what is idolatry? Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator for our hope and happiness, significance, and security. You know, as much as we just sang this song with all of our hearts, and as much as we want to rejoice and give thanks in all circumstances, we continue to find ourselves in sin. And we grieve that all of us are guilty of what James 3.10 says, which is on the screen, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. We're bitter, discontent, and angry. We're anxious, worrisome, and discouraged, so we complain, we doubt, and we turn to the created things to find comfort, strength, and hope. Well, James says that this should not be for Christians. Pastor Jason Mayer said, repenting is resizing. That we should start with God as our standard of reference and then resize all that we see in relation to him. And I want to invite all of us to spend some time confessing our sins. And let us resize everything in reference to our God so that we may love him better. Let's read this prayer together as a response. Creator God, forgive us for worshiping the things you have made. No person or thing should be our hope or our trust. You alone are self-existent and all-sufficient. May you be our all in all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Then let's sing this song and declare this gospel truth to our souls.
sing, He became. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, you are Lord of all. His body the bread, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broke it and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners, ransom from me. Lord of all, all our hope, all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory. Our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory to you, God. The light of the Jesus Messiah, name above all names, you are blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all.
sing what gift what gift of grace is jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to his Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Night is dark. Night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoice. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my part. And He was raised to overthrow the to this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free and not I, but through Christ. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me
by night. What waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my Thy my true word, I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I Thy true Son, Thou with me I with thee one. Oh God, be mine. Oh God, be my everything. Be my delight. Be Jesus, my glory, my soul satisfied. Riches I no man's empty praise, thou mine inheritance, now in the ways, thou in thou only, but first in my. I, King of heaven, my treasure thou art. O oh, God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul. Satisfied, I King, I King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to City on a Hill. For today's congregational reading, we will be reading this prayer together. I will read the passage, and then if you can follow after that. Passage comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to chapter 5, verse 2. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's read this prayer together. Merciful Father, Mighty Holy Spirit, most compassionate Lord Jesus, great and gracious triune God, we praise you today for the love with which you love us, in which you have rooted us, and by which you are transforming us. There is no other God like you. There is no other God but you. As we meditate through this scripture and consider how high of a bar you have set for us, 
in terms of loving one another, we quickly run to you today for the promised resources of the gospel. There is no other way we will even begin to love as an imitator of God. We need tons of grace for this calling. Father, we don't want to live today just with a theoretical or theological awareness of being your dearly loved child. Let it be deeply experiential and personal, very real, very encouraging, and very liberating. All day long, let us hear you serenading us in the gospel. Indeed, help us hear you rejoicing over us with singing, as unreal of a thought that, as that is. Let us taste your great delight in us, though our unbelief fights against such a notion, and quiet us with your love, for we have a restless, noisy heart. Lord Jesus, you are so kind, compassionate, and forgiving. We want the fragrant aroma of your grace to permeate and encourage all our relationships. You're not calling us to fix or change anybody. Free us for listening to others from our heart, being present in their stories, and offering the wisdom and hope of the gospel. God, the Holy Spirit, you who raised Jesus from the dead, give us the power we will need today to rid ourselves of any expressions of bitterness, rage and anger, brawling, slander and malice. Convict us of the ways we grieve you by our attitudes and actions and free us to love and serve others with joy today. This we pray in Jesus' peerless and powerful name, amen. Well, good afternoon, church. It's our seventh week on, of our online worship, and it still feels unnatural. It feels weird being in the sanctuary alone and empty. I miss seeing everyone and, and hope you're doing well and, and staying safe. Well, today we are continuing in Ephesians. So please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Pastor Uyun spoke on the importance of our speech in chapter 4. And today we're looking at the first 14 verses of chapter 5. Please follow along as I read. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of God. If I had asked you on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being unholy and 10 being almost perfectly holy, what number would you give yourself? There are things you'd have to consider like what is holiness or what are the criteria for being holy? Or on a, on a scale of one to 10, how closely do you imitate Christ? From today's passage, 
I want us to understand deeper what it means to live the Christian life. As we unpack the text, consider these, this core idea. Christian life is the reproduction of holiness as seen in the person of Christ. There are three main points that I want to be sharing. One, the root of Christian living is being imitators of God. And two, the result of imitating God is a life of holiness. And number three, the reason that we live the Christian life is because of a new nature. So let's start with the first point. The root of Christian living is being imitators of God. You can see that the first two verses of the text is the thesis statement. So follow along as I read the first two verses. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Chapter 5 is, is a continuation of Paul's instruction for Christian living. The walk or life of a believer is very important to him. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, he says, Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul urges his readers uh, that they must no longer live as Gentiles do. In chapter 5, 8, it says, Live as children of light. And later on in verse 15, be careful, be very careful then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. The walk of a Christian is of utmost importance. In the first two verses of today's text, we are told to walk in the way of love. Growing in love is a continual need for every believer. But how are we to walk in the way of love? Well, it says by following God's example and imitating Christ. The word therefore refers back to the last part of chapter 4. And I'm just going to read the last two verses. It says this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in, in, just as in Christ God forgave you. It mentions the kindness, the compassion, and forgiveness of God. These are three characteristics highlighted by Paul of who God is. And we are told to follow God's example. In another translation, it, it says, be imitators of God. Now, an imitator comes from the word to mimic, which means someone who copies specific characteristics of another person. The new Michael Jordan documentary came out last week. Think of all the people who watched Jordan play and tried to imitate his shot, from his footwork to even sticking out his tongue, that fadeaway shot, and even the smooth follow-through. There must have been thousands of people trying to mimic MJ. They even had that, that commercial by Gatorade, which their slogan was, I want to be like Mike. As imitators of God, Christians are to imitate the characteristics of God, and above all else, that's love. How are we able to imitate God's example of love? Well, because he demonstrated his love for us first. As we find two ways, and, and we find two ways in which he showed us his love. Number one, he calls us his children. And two, Christ gave himself up for us. These two go hand in hand. They're intimately connected. God calls us his children. Think of your parents for a moment. As their child, it's only natural that you grew up with similarities. Just think about it. In what ways are you like your parents? When I think of my sister, she gets her heart of hospitality from my mom. And also, she is a great cook. It's inevitable that we would have caught on to habits and characteristics of our parents. And through Jesus, God has given us the right to become children of God. And therefore, we too can grow in imitating him. If you go back to the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul writes, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, 
he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And since we have been adopted by God and called his dearly loved children, we walk in the way of love. But what is that way of love? The greatest evidence of love is forgiveness. Let me add to that. The greatest evidence of love is undeserved forgiveness. We've heard this verse many times and probably memorized it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love brought us forgiveness. Forgiveness we didn't deserve. His love was so great that he offered forgiveness and eternal life to sinful and rebellious people by sending Jesus, his only son, to give up his life on the cross for, for us so that, we might have not, we, so that we don't have to suffer the wrath of God. It's because of the love of Christ that we can have fellowship with God for eternity. It says in the end of verse 2 that the love that Christ displayed by giving himself up and dying for us is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Back in the Old Testament, there were different kinds of offerings lifted to God. Burnt offerings, grain, peace, sin, and guilt offerings. And each had its purposes, but these offerings and sacrifices were made to remind God's people of God's holiness and their sinfulness. The penalty of sin is death, and in order for your sin to be atoned for, atonement meaning to be reconciled with God, blood needed to be shed. So they would bring animals to be killed. Now could you imagine the impact emotionally and spiritually of offering these sacrifices, knowing that it was your sin that made this death necessary. And imagine the frustration in knowing that you'll be back tomorrow or some soon after because you will sin again. God knew that we would never be able to atone for our own sins. So he sent Jesus to become our atoning sacrifice so that we would be reconciled to God once and for all. We have become dearly loved children of God because of Christ's sacrificial death. He is the Lamb of God who was slain and the fragrance of Christ's offering as he rose from the dead and conquered sin and death was pleasing to God. It signified the acceptance of the sacrifice. And that was God's plan all along. God's purpose in salvation is to redeem us from sin and to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus. And to be conformed to Christ is to become perfect, just as God is perfect. Peter said, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. But above all, we imitate God's love. And his love consists of kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. 1 Peter 4, 8 commands us to, above all, love each other deeply because your love covers a multitude of sins. In Luke chapter 7, we, we have this narrative, this this occasion of a woman, a, a woman who li who's living in sin, who approaches Jesus and she's weeping and she falls at the feet of Jesus, her tears covering, her, covering Jesus' feet. She uses her, her hair to wipe the tears off of Jesus' feet and then pours this alabaster jar of perfume over Jesus' feet. And as she is doing that, people are wondering what's going on and Jesus, uh, Jesus tells a story of two men who owed money to a moneylender. 
let's say this per one person owed a million dollars and the other person owed a hundred dollars. But the mon money lender chooses to forgive both debts and he asks, which one of these peop this person who, who owed the debt loves the money lender more? And they answered the one with more debt. And Jesus looks at them and he says this, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Brothers and sisters, does your love for one another promote forgiveness of sins? Is there someone in your life today that you need to forgive or seek forgiveness? Christ gave himself up for us for you and me so that we can be forgiven and should we not do likewise we need to remember the power of Christ's forgiveness and and allow his forgiveness and love to affect us in how we love and how we forgive we must imitate God's love the root of Christian living is being imitators of God that's the first point However, as we get into verse 3, Paul shifts gears and starts with the word but. In verses 1 and 2, it starts us off with the model of Christian living, to imitate God and walk in the way of love just as Christ did. But he knows that his fellow believers and every one of us struggle to perfectly live this out. So follow with me as in verse 3. It says this, but among you... There, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Paul is calling his readers out. But among you who are believers, there must not be a hint of, and, and he goes on with this list of sins. What is that implying? There are Christians who do not follow in God's example and imitate Christ. Why? Because there is still sin that they commit. The second point is this. The result of imitating God is a life of holiness. Here's the problem. Even though we are washed by the blood of the Lamb, even though we have been saved and redeemed by Jesus, and even though we have experienced God's love, we still fall into sin. The church in Ephesus wasn't any different Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. When God displays his great, perfect, steadfast love, Christ, or Satan is deceiving us into compromising for a counterfeit love. God's love is kind, compassionate, and forgiving. The world's love is lustful and self-indulgent. Satan has tainted what love is by making it all about me, satisfying my own needs, my desires, and my expectations giving little but getting much. This worldly love is misguided and draws us away from God. And that is why there must not be even a hint of these sins. He continues by listing off six sins. Now before I list these six sins, there's something that I want to make very clear. Paul is not saying that if, if you don't commit these sins, you will be saved. If that was the case, then no one can be saved. Remember that this is a letter that he's writing to the church of Ephesus. And though they are believers, there are still things that they struggle with. And things such as sexual immorality, which is sexual sin. Uh, impurity, which is more about immoral thoughts and passions, ideas and fantasies and any form of sexual corruption. And greed, and it, which is covetousness. And there is a strong connection to sexual immorality and, impur and impurity because the church of Ephesus struggled with sexual sin. He also w warns us of obscenity, and, and, which is filthy talking or filthiness, and foolish talking, which is just complete and utter, utter nonsense, or coarse joking, with, which is filthy talk of a person uh, to hurt or harm people. Sexual sin and the use of speech is what Paul draws out for the believers to be reminded that these sins are improper for God's holy people. 
it falls short of God's command to love and, and be holy. It is the opposite of imitating him. Therefore, there must not be even a hint of these sins. If God gave you a list of sins you struggle with and must avoid, what would be on that list? What would that list consist of? I'm pretty sure there would be very similar list to this one. But we must avoid all sin. We, we must avoid giving into sin. The phrase, there must not even be a hint, is also translated as, these sins must not even be mentioned or named among you. As Christians, we must live a life of holiness. Therefore, we shouldn't even have to mention sins like sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Paul shouldn't have to name uh, these sins if we are truly following God's example. Holiness is what it means to be a Christian, but we sin. We fall short every day. And here's the scary part about sin. We are told that there must not be any hint of sin, but how many times do we compromise and say, it's not too bad, that's not too bad? How many times do we watch movies and shows on Netflix and justify the content? Or worse, we don't justify it at all. Just write down a list of the shows and movies you watched this past week and really think about what we're watching. I'm guilty of this too. The question is, have we become comfortable with sin in our lives and sin around us, including media? If we are comfortable with sin, even a hint of it, this is not the attitude and life for which Christ died. Friends, it starts with a small compromise, letting a hint of sin creep in. And then before you know it, you're living in sin, not in Christ. We must be killing it. We must be killing sin. How are we then to counteract immorality and filthy speech? Well, in verse 4 it says, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is an expression of unselfishness. An unselfish person cares for the needs of others. Someone who gives thanks is appreciative of the blessings they've received and not focused on trying to, what, to get what they desire. They are satisfied in all the good and perfect gifts that have been given by God. They are thankful for God's love and what Christ has done for them. They are thankful for the holy life that they are to pursue and, and they're satisfied in that life. And people see God's love in them. I ask myself whether that describes me. I struggle every day. I want to be thankful and I, and I want to be satisfied in Christ. But what happens then to those who are immoral, impure, and greedy? Also called idolaters because they covet created things rather than desiring the creator. Paul makes it very clear, God does not tolerate sin and there is punishment for sin. And what is that punishment? No inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No one who follows the patterns of this world belongs to God. In other words, if you continue on sinning, you are not a part of God's kingdom. John MacArthur writes, God's children have God's nature. Listen carefully to what John says in his letter. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Isn't this a sobering truth? The way you live your life will show whether you are a child of God or a child of the devil. There's only two options. Every person who is saved is instructed to forsake sin and seek righteousness. I'm not saying that Christians will never sin, but we need to remember the forgiveness of Christ. We are forgiven. The hope that those who believe in Jesus is that by the power of the Holy Spirit living in them, we pursue holiness. For those who, who are Christian, does your life reflect holiness? Think back to that scale of 1 to 10. 
which area of your life do you need to change? We are warned not to deceive with, not to be deceived with empty words, and do not partner with those who are disobedient. Who are the disobedient? Those who are giving into these sins. Why? Because those who are disobedient will receive the wrath of God. There will be people who try to deceive you into believing that sin is tolerable and that God will not judge you for, for unrepentant sin. But those are empty words because they are false. There is no truth in that at all. John, 1 John 3 says this, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Whenever you justify your sin, or any sin, quickly turn to God in repentance, because we know that God hates sin, and his wrath will come. There are consequences to our sins. Christ came so that we, we would no longer be bound by sin, but set free to follow him. Therefore, do not be partners with them, though disobedient. Now, does that mean we never talk to them or associate with non-Christians? Do we create our own little bubble and only hang out with Christians? Am I not allowed to be friends or work with those who don't believe in Jesus? Absolutely not. But we are not to join the world in doing evil and sin. Don't be partners in wickedness. Rather, be partners with Christ in righteousness. Don't imitate the world. Be an imitator of God as his dearly loved child. Okay, so the first point was that the root of Christian living is being imitators of God. The second point is the result of imitating God is a life of holiness. That leaves us with the final point. The reason that we live the Christian life is because of our new nature. The remainder of the passage continues by telling us why we must imitate God. Verses 18 to 14. We follow his example because God has given us a new nature, a new identity. We were once darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. So in order to imitate God, we must reflect his light. We were once darkness. Notice the past tense that we were once, implying that there was a time we were darkness, but we are no longer. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. John Calvin wrote, Darkness is the name here given to the whole nature of man before regeneration. For where the brightness of God does not shine, there is nothing but fear, fearful darkness. Regeneration is when we are born again, when God has given us a new heart and we became a new creation. Therefore, when we went from being darkness to light, a new nature was given to us. Christ delivered us from darkness and transferred us into his kingdom. He called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Just as we are called children of God, we are also called children of light. And therefore, we must walk in light. For those who have been saved from sin and, and regenerated, they must, be, they must get, get rid of sin. They must be through with sin and live as redeemed purified children of God. If in the previous passage, verses 3 to 7, we were given what not to do in pursuit of holiness, Paul gives us four ways in how children of light with our new nature ought to live. The first is that the, the fruit of light must be evident in verse 9. This fruit consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And it parallels with the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, which is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Goodness is evident in our relationship with one another. We must always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Righteousness, is, is, righteousness can be evident in both our relationship with God and others. When we believe in Jesus, we are considered righteous before God, but we can also live righteously to choose what is right. And lastly, truth is living with integrity and honesty, not giving into what is false and reverting back to the old nature of darkness and sin. The second way to live as a, as a children of light is found in verse 10. And find out what pleases the Lord. A life that wants to find out what pleases the Lord is a description of a changed heart. When, when was the last, for last time you thought of what pleases the Lord? What would the ratio of the number of times you think about what pleases God versus what pleases you be? It can be a very humbling thought. Perhaps as an application, try to pause and think of what would please the Lord today and obey it. The third way is to live as children of light. The third way to live as children of light is to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. And this also pleases the Lord. The child of light should never identify with wickedness and sin found in darkness. What are these fruitless deeds of darkness? Just look back at what Paul mentioned in chapters 4 and 5, including sexual immorality, impurity, greed, and filthy speech. And there's so many more things. But as Christians, we must avoid all kinds of sin. And we avoid sin in order to be a witness to those in darkness. And that's the fourth way to live as children of light. Simply avoiding sin and darkness isn't everything. Christians are, always, are also called to expose sin. To be silent and ignore sin would be to encourage it. It's like when no one speaks about an injustice that has occurred. What happens? Nothing. The injustice continues and sin perpetuates because it is not confronted. This exposure can be direct and indirect. Sometimes you have to just confront a person face to face. But other times, it's by living in obedience to God, you are exposing sin. Have you ever been in a dark room before? I recently moved into a basement, and, and when it's night and I, and I turn off my lights, it is pitch black. I can't even see right in front of me. But when I turn my phone light on, it goes from not being able to see anything to be able to see everything in the room. It's like that with holiness being the light to sin. We cannot witness to the world if we do not go out into the world. And we are called to go and shine the light of Christ out of darkness, out in darkness. But when we compromise God's standards of holiness, it weakens our, weak, our witness. There are times when I failed to be a witness of Christ to my non-Christian friends when I was younger. They would be so shocked when I told them that I was a Christian because my words and my actions did not fall in line. How does your level of holiness hold up when witnessing to people? How bright does the light of Christ shine in you? For some of us, we may be thinking that just simply trying to live the Christian life is already hard enough. How could I be a witness and expose the sin of others? And that is why we must mature and grow in obedience, holiness, and love so that we can be light in dark places. We must follow in God's example and imitate Christ in his love so that Christ would use us to bring those in darkness into light. Now here's a caveat that we read in verse 12. It says, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. There are some sins that are so disgusting and shameful that it could be better to spare the details of that sin. Sometimes sharing every detail can do more harm than it could help, but every expo everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Verse 13. What is the light? It reveals and convicts us of sin. It directs us in the life of holiness. It reveals to us God's love for us and the example he gave us. It's the light that caused this blind heart to see. It's the word of God. We must test and improve everything through scripture in order to imitate God and live a holy life. We must be in the word because God will expose any darkness through it. 
for it is light that makes everything visible. We see the hiddenness and ugliness of sin in the light. All of this is only possible when we are given a new nature. We live the Christian life because we went from darkness into light. Let me just conclude with this. Many scholars think that verse 14 is an Easter hymn that was sung. It's a reference to Isaiah chapter 16 verse 1 which reads, Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. It continues in verses 2 and 3. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This is an invitation a call to those who are not children of light, those who are not yet Christian. It's a call to come to the light and be saved. Verse 14 says, wake up, sleeper. It's describing the sinner who is asleep in the darkness of sin and is unaware that the wrath of God is coming. But then the next line reads, rise from the dead. It's a call to repent of your sins and turn away from the fruitless deeds of darkness. Confess your sins to God and ask Jesus to come into your life, believing that he has died for your sins so that you may have eternal life with God. Trust that he is your Lord and Savior today. And if you do that, this is the promise. And Christ will shine in you. This is the good news. This is the gospel. The light of Christ shines on every sinful person that comes to him. Then you can proclaim, I once was darkness, but now I am light. I pray that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. For those who are Christians, brothers and sisters, living the Christian life is not easy. But we have seen and experienced the love of God. We know of his kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. We have tasted and seen that God is good and that we are saved by his, the precious blood of Christ crucified on the cross. And we have hope that he rose and conquered the grave. We, we are prone to wander, but thanks be to God that by his grace we are redeemed and are made new. Therefore, we can grow in holiness if we obediently and joyfully follow in God's example and imitate Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much and we give you praise that you have revealed your love for us, that because you have forgiven us of our sins, that we could look to you and we are made new, that we have a new nature, that you brought us from darkness into light. Lord, I pray that you would help us to pursue a life of holiness, that we are prone to wander, Lord. Every day we struggle. But Lord, help us to rid ourselves of all sins, to be killing sins, so that we could become more and more like you, Lord, to shine the light of Christ to those who are in darkness. So Lord, we thank you for your word today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We were once darkness, but now we're called to live as children of light. What an amazing truth, and this is God's will for us. But we also know that there will be troubles and challenges along the way. We will fail. Uh, we will disappoint God and ourselves. As we sing this next song, Let's remember the hope that we have in Christ, in Christ alone. So let's sing this song together. What is, what is our hope? In life and death, Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days? 
within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death what truth can calm the troubled soul God is good, God is good, where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our feet when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial. Who sends the waves that bring us nigh Unto the shore, the rock of Christ Oh, sing hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our open life and death unto the grave what will we sing Christ he lives Christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring everlasting life within there we will rise to meet the Lord sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death For today, the announcements are many things, and uh, we don't know whether you are looking at the bulletin in our website, but I do ask that you look at it weekly and just see what's been going on. Um, but, but from the bulletin, I'd like to just highlight a few things. We want to congratulate Gloria and Jung as they have had, they just had their second daughter. Her name is Catherine, so please send them emails, call them, and text them, and, and uh, send your congratulations. Uh, just to let you know, as Pastor Peter has sent an email, online offering is ready. You can check the website, and there is a instruction that you can download to understand a little bit more. Just to let you know, there is a 1.9% user fee. And let, to let you know, we checked and found that this was the lowest uh, user fee. So uh, we have done our due diligence and this is what we, what we have come up with. And um, Pastor, uh, Pastor Peter said, Linda has tried it and it works. So uh, let's start offering um, to the Lord again. 
Um, and also, we want to continue to um, really encourage you to pray. And in our uh, bulletin, there is a, a long sec session, section for prayer, and in particular, to continue to pray for Emerson as she is in the hospital still going through the treatment. Um, also to let you know that Don and Jenny McIsaac are planning to return back to Toronto as a school that they have been ministering at has been closed down and they don't know when it'll return to normal as we are all waiting. So let's welcome them back when they do return. And also, uh, as you know, uh, I feel like the list is growing, but there are many of our church members who have lost their jobs or have been put on hold for a certain time. Let's continue to pray for them, for we know that there are some concerns that come when our finances um, are shrinking. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters. But also, one other prayer request that I do ask is that there are families in our church who have special needs, whether it's their children or there could be physical, there could be mental, there could be a lot of different things. So let's continue to lift them up in prayer. Well, church, I hope you have a great week. We received a great and challenging message today about living for Christ, living in holiness as imitators and children of God. And so let me close with this uh, very, very um, uh, relevant prayer. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.